Well, good morning, everyone. If you go ahead and find your seat, we'll be starting in. Thank you very much. We ran over another service a little bit. Uh, David Thomas was talking way too much here in this part, so uh, he won't do that this service, I promise. Okay, well, thanks for choosing to worship with us today. You've chosen a special day to worship with us. This is going to be a very, very good day. We've got a couple of focus. We'll deal with one this morning. Right at the beginning, and then we'll move into worship and deal with the other. Uh, this morning, Janice Parham is here worshiping with us. Janice Parham has been our church secretary for 33 years and is retiring this week. So she has prepared a video that she would like to share with you because she can hold her composure in the video. And up here, she would be you know, slobbering all over the podium. So we don't, we don't need that. So uh, you check out the video that she's uh, prepared for us.
in my dim night before, I knew then you could reach heaven. I knew then why God had given me two church families. I joke and say, God knew how needy I was, so that's why he allows him to come here, so I would have two churches. That way, one church doesn't always have to bear the entire blood of me. But no matter the reason, you were and continue to be my family. When you stay in a place as long as I have, you really do start rubbing off on each other, especially the girls in the office. On many days, Nancy, Deborah, Karen, and I would come into the office, and at least two of us would be dressed alike. And we all always had to make the best of it, no matter what we did. Some of my best friends are members here, and we share many memories. You never know where we will be at any given time. You might even end up in Alaska with some. If all these times were not enough, you again, just one month ago, held me up again to the Father. I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, which meant going for many doctor's appointments, as well as having radiation every day, Monday through Friday, for almost a month. I remember sending my email to the pastors and the personnel committee apologizing and feeling guilty for having to miss work. The time I remember the most is Pastor Mike and Deborah praying for me in the office and Pastor Greg saying to me, I should not apologize. I should concentrate on getting well. But what took me by total surprise was when Will Rogers, a member of the personnel committee, came to the office to visit me on behalf of the entire committee. He stated that they were behind me in prayer as well as supporting me in any way needed and then had prayer for me. One day later, the chairman of the personnel committee, Stephen Camp, sent me an email assuring me that you, the church, was behind me. My part of this glorious journey with you is coming to an end. I will never, ever forget you as long as I live. If I'm still alive when I'm 90 and I hear your name or I hear a First Baptist Clover, I will shed a tear of joy and my heart will skip a beat. I will say to myself, those were the good old days. I plan to see you all when we are called to our heavenly home. So when that happens, give me a chance to worship our Savior and a chance to seek him. But then, save some time for me. I will surely want to sit by the banks of the crystal sea with you and catch up on lost times. Until then, I will always have you in my heart. served you so well, and I thank you that you gave him, you've given her to us for a time, and I ask that you would bless her now in her retirement to laugh, to enjoy life, to, to uh, visit us often, and to be faithful to her church, and Father, I thank you that you have, you have given her to us for this season, now she is in your hands, in Christ's name, amen. Thank you for honoring her. Uh, like I said in the early service, I don't think I mentioned here, but coming this coming week, uh, we'll be having uh, snacks and things all week long out in the guest uh, services area right out here in the guest center. And you come by, grab a snack, and tell Janice thank you for serving and, and come by and do that this week. That would be uh, most appropriate and memorable. Thank you. All right, so now let's turn our heart to uh, worship, and we're going to worship today, and we're going to hear from Jamie the importance of living 
uh, intentional missional lives. So let me read for you the Great Commission beginning in Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountains to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and in earth on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, this chance to meet in, in your name and for your honor alone. And so now we, we focus our attention squarely, fully on you. As a spiritual act of worship, we give you our full attention and our voices, and our offerings, and all that we have and are. You are worthy of so much more, but this is what we can give today. Father, I ask that you would allow us to worship you in spirit and truth, and not turn your back to us, not hide your, your face from us, but squarely look at us, examine us, and prepare us for the coming week. We desire, we are desperate for this moment, so meet us here. As we begin to sing, we will lift you up. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
Good morning. Happy to be here this morning. Thank you very much for that. As many of you know, my wife Don and I are going to be moving this summer um, down to Central Florida, down to Denellan, Florida, to join full time with a mission organization named ITEC. So this past Friday, a couple of the men from ITEC, um, a couple of the leaders there, uh, drove to our home and been staying with us. And we've had, a, we've had a great time together. I've, I've served with these guys more on foreign soil than I've actually had time to spend with them here in the States. And spending that time with them, I have come to have a, a really, really great respect um, and admiration for these guys. They're very, very good at them ministries that they, they do. They wear many hats um, with iTech and um, so so Steve Saint, not Steve Saint, I'm sorry. Um, I knew I'd do that. So one of the guys here is Steve Buell and he is the head trainer. He's the guy that, that's you know, I, I've got to learn a lot to, to get where he's at as far as training indigenous believers uh, with all the hurdles that comes with. Uh, but, but he and I have trained together for most every trip I've been on, and um, it's been a real, real eye-opening experience for me. And Jamie Saints here today. He's going to speak to us. Uh, Jamie's dad, Steve Saint, is the founder of iTech, and Jamie is also the grandson of Nate Saint, who was killed um, in 1956 in the Ecuadorian jungle. So, Jamie, you come share, and uh, we'll be challenged. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. You may be wondering what this is. You'll find out in a little while. So, before we get started, um, I want to just share a couple of things. One, um, I'm going to be reading from this book, Enter the Sphere, and uh, there are copies that you can have for free. You can make a donation if you want as well um, for the book, but you can pick one up. There's some brochures over there and a newsletter list um, if you want to keep up with what's going on with the ministry and Dave and Donna and all that. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. Now this morning, uh, the goal that we have when you leave this place, I want you to have a better understanding of the Great Commission and to know that God has gifted every Christ follower for meaningful participation in the Great Commission. If you leave here and you don't know the Great Commission, it's because you fell asleep. And on, you know, I won't call you out, um, but hopefully that's what we're, where we're going today. Now, to a little bit of information um, about my family, and that's where we're going to start. Then we're going to talk a little bit about ITEC, and then we're going to mainly focus on the Great Commission. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to leave with this illustration that I'll, that I'll do about the Great Commission. There is a picture that I have that I'd like to share with you. This is my family. Um, if you don't recognize, that's me in the middle, my wife in the pink, and those are our seven daughters. Yeah, so now you know how to pray for me. <laughs> you know, um, there is a lot of estrogen in the house. Um, but just to make matters a little bit more fun, we have two female dogs as well. So normally, non-COVID times, I travel a lot more than I do right now. And uh, people ask me, they like, Jamie, why do you travel so much? I show them this picture, and. Yep, they understand completely. <laughs> so my grandfather, Nate Saint, was a missionary pilot down in Ecuador, um, South America in the 1950s. He served other missionaries that were living with tribal people in the rainforest. What he would do is he would fly supplies and people back and forth. But there was one area of the rainforest that nobody else would fly over. And it was because of the people that lived there. 
back in those times when it was known as the Alka territory, because nobody had ever gotten close enough to these people to know what they called themselves, which is well known. Um, before I go any further, I want to teach you just one tribal custom that we do down there. Are you up for that? You know, it'll really kind of round out your experience and, and I think really get you closer to God. Okay? So I want you to put one hand down here like this. Okay? Now your other hand up like this. And then bring it together. Go Gators. fly in, in over this one territory and, and around the middle of 1955 he spotted a clearing um, where the wild donkey lived. Uh, it was one family group. Now to understand that group of people, um, they were an egalitarian society, which means there's no hierarchy of any kind. There's no chief, there's no laws, there's you do whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. But there did become four unwritten rules that everybody lived by. Rule number one, if somebody does something that offends you, ignore it. Rule number two, if somebody does something that offends you and you can't ignore it, kill them. Rule number three, if somebody kills somebody in your family group, it's not only your right, it's your obligation to kill somebody in their family group. And finally, rule number four, if whether you've been offended or to avenge death in your family, you're going to kill somebody in another family group, take your whole family group with you, kill the whole other family group, that way there's nobody to come and kill you and your family. There were a society of death, anthropologists who have since studied this tribe, have called them the most violent society to have ever existed on this planet that's been studied. They had a 60% homicide rate inside the tribe. But my grandfather believes what the Bible says is true, that in the last day, there will be people from every nation and tribe and kindred and tongue willingly before his throne giving him praise. And says, doesn't that include the wrong one? And if we don't go, then who will? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So after locating that, that village or that clearing, he began uh, giving gifts. He used what he had thought through in, in college, what we call the bucket drop. He had used this with other missionaries when there were sensitive things that they needed to deliver, when there was no airstrip, they could drop it by parachute or they could use the bucket drop. And the parachute was a, you know, a little bit more guesswork than the bucket drop. What he would do is he would um, think of an ice cream cone, you know, one of those sugar cones, and there's the round top and the point at the bottom where the ice cream always drifts out of, right? So he would fly his plane in tight circles at the top of that ice cream cone. He'd be about 500 feet above the ground, and he would let out between 1,000 and 1,200 feet of line with a bucket tied to the end. And as he would make those tight circles, the bucket would work in the opposite way of the airplane until it was hanging motionless below the airplane. And then he would let out the line and the bucket would go straight down. And he began giving gifts to the tribe. He gave things like axes and machetes, pots and pans, things that they could not get unless they killed the outside people to steal them. Well, pretty soon, the Indians built a, uh, a platform about 15 feet high on which to receive the bucket and soon were beginning to give gifts back. Things like a feathered headdress. Um, you guys, the, their feathered headdresses come from several birds, but one is a toucan. You guys know what a toucan is? Right, the long bead. It's the fruit loop bird on the commercial and on, sometimes on the box. So that's a toucan. Well, he gave things like a live parrot. That live parrot became my dad's pet when he was just uh, five years old. And then they even gave things like roasted monkey meat. Now, has anybody had roasted monkey meat in this room? 
Nobody? Where's Jerry? Did you, did you get monkey meat when you were down there? No, but I got soup cans. <laughs> then people, would you like to know what monkey meat tastes like? Who, somebody said something. You, you would think chicken, right? No, it doesn't. It doesn't taste anything like chicken. chicken. It tastes just like toucan. <laughs> so finally, it was around Christmas time, and my grandfather, who was 32 years old, talked to some of his missionary friends, Jim Elliott, Raju and Gary, and Pete Fleming, and Edna Coley, and said, now's your time. We need to make contact. I want to read just a couple of things out of his journal that's found in the book End of the Spear um, that was at Christmas time. My grandmother wrote, as we have a high old time this Christmas, may we who know Christ hear the cry of the damned as they hurl headlong into the Christless night without ever change. A little bit later on he said this, if God would grant us the vision, the word sacrifice would disappear from our lips and thoughts. You know, anybody who is a missionary or who is a pastor, if they say this is a sacrifice or talk about the sacrifice they're making, don't listen to them. Because serving God is not a sacrifice. It's a privilege. And my grandfather wrote, if God would grant us the vision, the word sacrifice would disappear from our lips and thoughts. He was focused, he was determined. These men went, they had prefabricated a tree house. They built that to protect themselves from wild animals. My grandfather had found a, a beach or a sandbar on the edge of the river that was about 600 feet long. Which, if you know anything about flying, 600 feet is nothing. Very, very short. <clears throat> but they, they waited and they were there several days. My grandfather every night would fly the airplane out because overnight I've been in the Amazon where the river will rise, you know, two, three, four feet overnight because of rain that happens upriver from them. Every morning he would fly back and fly, finally on Friday, January 6, 1956, out of the jungle came two young ladies and a young man. There was no animosity, there was no hostility. The man that they nicknamed George, his tribal name named Kiwi, was fascinated with my grandfather's airplane. And so my grandfather took him for a ride, actually took him for two rides. The first ride, he flew him over the clearing so he could see his clearing from the air. But then Kiwi wouldn't get out of the airplane because he didn't care about seeing his, his clearing from the air. He wanted them to see him. Much like, you know, you or I, if we were to get a new car, we really don't care who we see while we're driving the car. We do care, care who sees us, right? Well, on that second flight, then Kiwi, because he wanted them to see him, he started, he sat down on the strut of the airplane. And being a pilot myself, I can only imagine what was going through my grandfather's head. And then, man, this is not going to end well if he falls. But then the next thought would be, well, how do I get him back in the airplane? Their uh, jungle costume was very easy to keep clean because there wasn't much to it. Um, you know, the string that went around their waist. Now, the ladies, if they were being very fashionable, they could put it around their knee or their elbow. Um, but that was it. Fortunately, Nankini made it back safely to the beach, and late that afternoon, after spending the day together, he and the younger of the two ladies left. The younger of the two ladies was, um, he wanted to marry, her brother said no, but this would be his fourth wife. His first wife was killed in a steering raid. His second wife, he drowned. Um, his third wife, he had two kids with her, and he wanted this young lady as his uh, fourth wife. The older of the two ladies, after they had left, stayed on the beach and actually left just before dawn. The men were ecstatic. They knew the next chapter that God was going to write in the story. And he was going to allow them to share the good news of Jesus with these people who so desperately needed it. Saturday came and went, and on Sunday, there was still no contact. So around noon, my grandfather flew his plane two bridges over to where their clearing was. 
Then he looked down and he didn't see anybody. And so as he was flying back towards the beach, he was looking down at the rainforest. Anybody who tells you the rainforest is almost gone, that's never been to the rainforest. You can fly all day in any direction and all you see is trees. <coughs> but there's three layers of canopy. So if you're looking down through the jungle, you can't see anything. But the rivers and snakes were all throughout the jungle. He looked down and he happened to see them crossing the river. So he called my grandmother who was always standing by on the radio and he said, Marge, it looks like they'll be here for the afternoon service. I'll call you again at 4 o'clock. Well, 4 o'clock came and there was no contact. Shortly after 3 o'clock, my grandmother's watch had stopped. As his body had been pierced with multiple spears, including one right through his head. They had thrown his body into the river. All five men, dead. But how can this be? How can a loving God tell his followers to do something for him and then allow them to die? You know, probably many of you could quote Romans 8, 28 that says, all things work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But I'll bet probably None of you would be able to quote 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall live happily ever after. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Just as a, as a challenge to you, if your life, if you haven't just been coming out of or, or entering or are currently in persecution, according to the Bible, you're not living God alone. That was a challenge to me. If I was to put those two verses together in the Jamie paraphrase, it would go something like this God has a story to write with your life. He doesn't promise that every chapter is going to be easy. In fact, he promises that if you allow him to write your story, there's going to be some very difficult chapters. But he will make sense of even the most difficult chapters before the end of the story. You see, that was just the end of one chapter of the story. Two years later, my great aunt, along with Elizabeth Elliot and her daughter Valerie, were invited in to live with the tribe. Two years after that, when my dad was nine years old, he got to go in for the first time. And through a series of events that you have to read about in the Engines of Spear, um, Minkai, the man who killed my grandmother, ended up adopting my dad as his own son, teaching him how to live out in the jungle. Well, in 1994, Aunt Rachel died of cancer and was buried out in uh, Sonia Fade, where, where she had lived a great deal of her life. And my dad went down for the funeral, and after the funeral, the people came to him and said, okay, Steve, his father out of his tribal name, said, you being our family, now the name of the dead, we say, you come and you live with us. We had been down multiple times down to the jungle, but this was not on my dad's radar or on his agenda. But, again, through a series of events we have to read about, in 1995, two weeks after I graduated from high school, we moved down to live in the Amazon rainforest, 60 miles out in the rainforest with the Rhino. And so we said, okay, what do you want us to do for you? And they said, no, we don't want you to do anything. They said, foreigners are always coming, and they come and they take care of our dental problems, and they take care of our medical problems. They even fly us from one place to another place in an emergency. But they said, there's two problems with that. Problem number one, they only come when it's convenient for them, not when we have a problem. Problem number two, when they come, they can only meet a physical need, but our people have a bigger need than a physical need, they have a spiritual need. So if you teach us what the foreigners know how to do, we will not only be here when there's a problem, but as we meet that physical need, we'll tell them how Jesus can fix our hearts. Well, that sounded like a great idea, but how do you do that? These people were living in a stone age. No formal education, very smart. By the way, low technology does not equate to low intelligence. 
But that was the idea behind the organization that we call ITEC, the Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center. At ITEC, we really did three, three things. We developed, we trained, and we equipped. We developed tools and training systems, taking technology from the first world and changing it for a context in the developing of third world. Then we used those tools and training systems to train indigenous Christ followers to be felt needs in their own community as a door opener to share the gospel. And we equip others to do the same. Now, I'm going to show you a video in just a few minutes, but there's five main trainings that we do at ITEC. We do dental training, where we take people with no formal dental training, no medical training typically, uh, no training or experience in this way of any kind. And in one week, we teach them how to extract teeth safely. So we do a day and a half of classroom training, and then four and a half days of clinics. And they have to extract 20 to 30 teeth in order to demonstrate proficiency so that they can continue to work after we go home. We also have medical training. Now these are places, rural places around the world where there are no dentists, there are no medical people. So they are the first line of defense for people that are hurting. This is also where the gospel typically is not heard. We also have a mechanical training. That, that's the training that David um, is going to be joining us to lead. Um, currently, Steve Buer, my uncle, um, leads that training and has done a great job of leading. We think David is the man uh, for that mission. We also have a film training because just about everybody in the world has smartphones. A statistic I read this last week said that 75% of the world's population have a phone. And then uh, finally farming. Most of the people that we train are pastors or church leaders who are also farmers, since we have a farming training. I want you to, to get a kind of a picture of what these look like. Um, I have a short four minute video that I'm going to show you, and then we'll move on to the Great Commission. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Oh, how quickly we ride over that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end. The Great Commission is a daunting task, but it was given to all followers of Christ in Matthew 28. While the Western Church is seeing declining participation in cross-cultural missions, we are seeing non-Western churches rise to this task. In fact, the number of non-Western missionaries are increasing by 13% yearly. The Indigenous Church is crossing ethnic boundaries to share the gospel. In many ways, they are already well equipped for the task because they speak shared languages and don't appear to be outsiders. This shift represents an opportunity for the Western Church to encourage, equip, and partner with the majority world church in this task. At ITEC, we want to help Christ followers understand that God has gifted every believer to participate in the Great Commission. Our goal is to eliminate the potential for dependency by partnering with, training alongside, and learning from the Indigenous Church. This interdependency is a concept found in passages throughout the Bible and directly in 1 Corinthians 12. At ITEC, we focus on three areas. Developing tools and training programs for the Indigenous Church training national Christ followers and equipping others to do the same, both domestically and abroad. While we cannot accomplish these tasks alone, we rely heavily on God's lead and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, as well as partnerships with like-minded organizations 
and churches around the world. Headquartered in Florida, ISAC has a core staff of about 20 individuals and a growing group of volunteers. We also have a facility in Shell, Ecuador, with more than 15 Ecuadorian nationals working to advance the mission in their own country. While our team continues to grow, our ultimate goal is to share the mission and vision with church leaders, missionaries, and like-minded people in the United States and around the world. Imagine seeing churches and organizations partnering all over the world, interdependent on each other, and leveraging each other's collective strengths, working together to spread the gospel to the far corners of the world. This is what we desire to see, and this is why we exist. So as an illustration that we're going to lay out for the uh, Great Commission so that you can better understand the Great Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. But before we do that, uh, I want to share a study with you that Vision Frontiers magazine released in uh, December, November, December edition of 2019. It asked churchgoers, so we're not talking about people that don't go to church or only go to church on Christmas and Easter. We're talking about people like you that are in church every week. And they asked them, do you know or have you heard the Great Commission? 51% of churchgoers said no, they had never heard the Great Commission. Only 17% said yes, and this is what it means. But yet, this is the mission that God has given us on this planet. And we don't even know what it is. So this morning, you're going to leave this place without an excuse. Okay? So I need some volunteers. Dave and Donna, thank you very much. Jerry, thank you very much. Come on up. In the first service, I had Dave do one role that I had Donna do in the last service. And Donna did it flawlessly. David had some challenges. So David, you're going to go over to this side of the stage. Jerry, you're going to stand right here on that line. You're going to face away from me. Perfect. Oh, Dave, see, Dave already knows what's going on. So Donna also knows. So I'm just going to give a little bit of this line before you get started. Okay, there you go, Donna. She is our man of life for today. There you go, go ahead. You may want to turn it over. Turn it around. There you go. All right. So today, how many of you know, I know you're going to want to watch Donna, but now you need to pay attention here. I have a question for you. How many people are living in the world today? Were you in the last service? Oh, I think we have a cheater here. 7.8 million. If you were in the last service or the first service, you are not permitted to answer these questions. But yes, 7.8 billion people are on the planet today, approximately. How many of those have never heard the name of Jesus? If you know, if somebody doesn't say, I'll call on you. I'm going to leave tomorrow, so it doesn't scare me. How many people? Four billion. Four billion. That's actually, now if Christ is right and rules, then you're all. I need one more person right here in the, in the nice view. Oh, uh, okay, now, because it's Christ is right, what you're supposed to do is go really low. So it's about 3.2 billion. Yeah, you would have won. 3.2 billion. So we're going to round down to 3 billion people. 3 billion people represent the Great Commission. Are you with me so far? Okay. This tape is a 300 foot tape. That 300 feet is going to represent the 3 billion people. Are you with me so far? Then you're focusing on Dawn. I'm going to focus here. 300 feet tape, foot tape is equivalent to 3 billion people. Are you with me? There's 3 billion people, that is the Great Commission. Are you still with me? Thank you very much. I'll set that down right where you are and have a seat. Now, today in the world, um, there are approximately, and if you come tonight, you're going to get a book uh, called The Great Omission, where this illustration is actually written out. 
but I like to show it rather than telling you about it because I think it makes for a more, you're going to retain it. So there's a, uh, about 100,000 evangelical long-term foreign missionaries in the world today, which means they're evangelical and they leave their home country and go to another country. On this tape, where this tape is the 3 billion people, if we were going to think of measurements to represent those 100,000, where do we get to? One, well, one inch, okay? Somebody else. You right there in the black. Yeah, you. How far do we get? He says one inch. Half an inch, okay. Price by rules, neither one of you are there. Those 100,000 missionaries represent about one eighth, one eighth of an inch. One eighth of an inch. Now let's say that these missionaries are just really, they're on fire, they're, they're just energized, and they're, they're just going. And each one of them reaches 500 people. Where do we get to? Uh, you right there in the black stripes. How about, take a half an inch, okay. Somebody else. Right here in the red. An inch, okay. Well, press press, you get you win. We actually get to about five feet. Okay? So if all those hundred thousand evangelical long term foreign missionaries each reach five hundred people, which would be very, very difficult to do, we get to five feet. So one of two things is the case. Either the Great Commission is an impossible task that God gave us so that he could look down and say, man, you guys are really screwing this up. Or, we're not doing God's will, God's way. Now, I have seven daughters. I have never told one of my kids to do something that I knew was impossible for them to do. Nor would God, being a good father, much better than me, he would never give his kids, you and me, a task that is impossible for us to do. Now, on this map, we have 100,000 missionaries. Now, the Great Commission says what? In, in three words, what does it say? Well, in two words, make disciples. Go make disciples. Now, let's say that each of those 100,000 missionaries, each disciple, 60 people from whatever land that they're going to. They disciple 60, and each of those 60 people reaches the 500. Where do we get to? 300 feet. 3 billion people. You can pull out your phone and you can do the math. The only thing that we're missing is we're trying to do it all ourselves. But Jesus didn't go and say, hey, go tell all the world about me. He said, go and make disciples. Evangelism is part of discipleship, but evangelism is not the Great Commission. Discipleship is. Now, just kind of at the point of interest, and I know I'm, I'm going to go over, and you know, if you leave, that's fine. Um, but lunch will still wait for a few more minutes. Of those, there's actually, the latest I saw, there's less than 53,000 long term foreign evangelical missionaries. There are 67,000 Mormon missionaries. Think about that for a moment. Of the 53,000 or 100,000 or whatever number you want to go with, of those missionaries, 90% are working in countries that are considered rich. Only 10% are going to countries that are considered unreached. Now, normally I'd give you a few reasons or a few things that we can do to kind of to, to change how we're doing missions in order to accomplish that, but you have to come tonight and get that. Back in 2006, um, I was traveling up to speak at a large youth convention up outside of D.C. or a conference, and uh, I had just finished a book I was reading, so on the airplane I borrowed a friend's book, and it was How to Support Your Pastor. And in the book, there was a Baptist preacher 
stalking their group of college students, and there's something like this. He said, children, one day you're going to die. They're going to take your body out, they're going to dig a hole, and they're going to put your body in there and take dirt on you. He said, when you came into the world, you were the only one crying. Everybody else was wild. He said, when they put your body in the ground, and they go back to church and eat potato salad, because that's what Baptists do. If there's an event, there's going to be food. So I love, I love speaking at Baptist churches, because I know I'm going to go home full, uh, but then I have to lose some weight when I get home. But anyway, he said, they're going to go back to church and eat potato salad. When they're back in church and eating potato salad, are they going to be talking about your titles, or are they going to be talking about your testimony? He said, when you came into the world, you were the only one crying. Everybody else was happy. When you leave, is there going to be anybody crying, or are they going to be happy to see you go? You know, so often in our world today, we're focused and we're told to focus on our, on our titles, the letters behind our name, the significant job that we have, all of these different things that are seemingly so important. But you know what? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So if today is your last day, are they going to be talking tomorrow or the next day about your titles or about your testimony? Who are you investing your life in who will have a significant impact for the sake of eternity? We are here on this planet for one purpose, and that purpose is called the Great Commission. It's about making disciples here and everywhere. And you need to ask yourself, what are you here on this? It doesn't matter where you get your paycheck. Man, if there's a secular company you work for that you get your paycheck from, awesome. They're paying you to live on mission. Your vocation doesn't matter. The mission is what matters. So church, you need to ask yourself today, who's writing your story? You know, in North America, we have this, this thought that what we want to do is we want to write our story, and then we'll turn it over to God to be our editor. He doesn't offer to be your editor. There was a book that came out in, uh, right after World War II. It says, God is my blue Bible. Let me tell you something, church. God does not offer to be your co-pilot. He wants to be the author and the finisher of your story. He doesn't, we can't turn it over and say, please edit this. But if we allow him to write the story of our lives, it will be focused on the mission, and he will make sense of even the difficult chapters before the story is over. So church, you need to decide this morning. Who's writing your story? And my challenge to you would be like God writes your story. Right, as the praise team comes back up, I will just ask you this uh, question of invitation today. Uh, you are, are going to die. One day you're going to die. You know, unless Jesus comes back and takes you to be with in heaven, you're, you're going to die. And what are you going to take with you? All you're going to take with you is what you did for Christ. What you did for Christ. So let these words that Jamie said echo through your thinking today. And reevaluate how you live your life. Are you truly living missionally? Are you living that way? If not, today's the day to vow to do so. Let's stand together as we sing this song. And you think about that as we sing this together.
us to make disciples, Father, let, let that be our life's prayer. Right here in our community and beyond, as far as the ends of the world, I pray you find us obedient because you are faithful, Lord. I pray we would follow suit and be faithful as well. We thank you for this reminder. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank you for coming today and worshiping with us. Thank you, Jamie and Steve, for being here. They'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock in this room for a intimate look at ITAC. Uh, we'll have pizza, but you'll need to sign up at fbcclover.life so that we have enough for you. I hope that you attend. We also will have great books for you if you attend tonight. Uh, we don't want we want you to uh, come and check the books out and, and buy some today, but we will have free books tonight as well. So uh, we hope that you'll come. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. We thank you for the reminder that we had today, Lord. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. See you tonight at 6 o'clock.